Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Hey, I'm Ross. Cody. Uh, as he said, we're the in-house composers and sound designers at Dots uh, in New York City. We'll start by telling you a little bit about ourselves. Cody and I met 14 years ago in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we went to high school together, and we played in a slew of really bad rock bands together. And I mean like really, really bad rock bands. Uh, we continued to make music together, and then we released uh, a number of records as artists for YK Records, a small record label in Brooklyn, uh, together and independently. Um, after touring and traveling, we found that we really liked working in the studio the most. We absolutely loved being in there and just kind of experimenting and playing around. So we stopped doing the artist thing and moved solely to being studio uh, producers and composers. We started Upright T-Rex Music in 2012, um, a custom music agency that makes music for film, television, web, and mobile games. Uh, our client list includes Google, AOL, Instagram, uh, The Verge, VHX, uh, Betaworks, and then eventually Dots. I met Patrick Moberg, the creator of Dots, in 2013 at a party in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, when he was developing the original Dots. He said he was working on some sort of thing that was a game maybe, he didn't know, he sent me a prototype, and then uh, we did the original sound design, and then we did two Dots, and now we are full-time employees with a studio in the meatpacking district. So. What we spend most of our time doing at DOTS is cultivating and refining the sound of our work. We're um, sticklers about the quality of it. And by quality, I don't mean the state of the art or the latest and greatest, but uh, quality as in um, a human attribute, a uh, personable quality. Um, and with making, using primarily electronic tools, it's easy to have things be very perfect, and that doesn't always relay to having a lot of character. Um, it's, it's a very uh, organic approach. Um, we, we value the Im imperfections. It's almost like if you, um, if you type a word, you can type it, and it comes out the exact same way every time. But if you handwrite it, it still is the same thing every time or it, it cannot be exactly the same thing every time, but still keeps its identity. And we find that very important in standing out in a, a market that's typically diluted with a lot of stock sounds and um, ready-made video game music. So one of the ways we do this is uh, through our incredible love for outdated technology. We absolutely love machines that are broken, um, shouldn't be used for making music, and are just kind of plain weird. We use tape machines, uh, real reels of all sorts, uh, 80s kids toys. What else do we use? Did you say VCRs? We love VCRs. Uh, we have many, many VCRs in our studio, and they are absolutely terrible. And this really, really helps us create these sounds that really stand out, uh, like he said, uh, amongst a lot of other games that have very um, straightforward and uh, in some sorts uh, cliche sounds. Uh, this machine here is what's called a Klimt Echolet 5. This is a machine I bought uh, while visiting my now wife in Germany. It's uh, an analog tape delay. It was made in 1964. Uh, it is very old and it, it barely works and it sounds very, very, very rough, but we use this uh, machine a lot when working on games. I'll show you what it does. So here's, a, here's a, a test sound we made. It's just a basic guitar. Now here's that same sound through this old broken machine. Now obviously it adds delay to it, which it's supposed to do with the tape reel, but also adds so much uh, saturation it adds so much uh, warmth and character. So we like we like to use tape machines because they vary so much from one to the next. Um, the little guy on the right is a Radio Shack microcassette recorder, um, prevalent I think in the 90s, 
and typically if we're recording lectures and speech, um, we love to record music through it for its, it has a very particular sound and picking up the room sound if you're recording something directly into its mic. So here's the um, same clip played through this tape machine. This is a machine that is very, very, very near and dear to my heart. This is an Emerson VCR that was in my childhood bedroom. I've had it since I was very, very little. And it actually still has the tape that I used to tape cartoons off of TV with inside. And we tape over the same 30 seconds over and over and over again because it is degraded in quality so much. Uh, I've carried this with me all around over the years. Um, here's that same sound through this VCR. <laughs> It seems like that's too much and that could never be in a game and so you have to sort of find the range of just how warped you want it to be but it's, I think it's all about a balance. You can you know, use cleaner tools and then sort of balance out the character with using things that basically kind of sound like crap but <laughs> in, a, in a way we subjectively like. So they're all, you never quite know what's going to come out typically but we find that very helpful in coming up with content. Um, I typically like to work with just having a lot of content and making a lot of content and just seeing stuff, um, hearing things and leading to other ideas or new sounds um, versus just sitting blankly and trying to come up with something out of thin air. Um, it's more about I think coaxing a certain sound out of the machine versus commanding it and telling it exactly what to do. I think you often come up with uh, more interesting results that way. And while we talked a lot about analog and sort of bizarre weird technology, we also will use modern technology to control these old devices. Um, we'll often take uh, a computer and set the parameters to control an analog machine and then just let the analog machine run for 10 minutes, sometimes 15, 20 minutes, and then wait for that machine to generate the kind of content we want it to generate. And you could control the parameters of how random the, comput, the output is of the content. Um, and this modern technology helps you to see the old technology in a new light because it, it basically makes it a lot easier to use the old technology and manage it and edit it. So we're not uh, totally bashing digital quality. We actually, yeah, I mean, it's so helpful. Sometimes we'll let a machine run for 10, 15 minutes when we're doing sound design, and then go back and find little tiny pieces that we love and something, take that out, and then expand upon that greatly. Which, if you were doing that in the 60s with some of these machines we looked at, that would take hours as opposed to seconds. Yeah. Uh, one of the more obvious examples is the idea of just being very hands-on with what we do. Um, knob tweaking, as we call it, using analog machines and Playing around with it uh, is incredibly fun. Uh, it's kind of obvious when you look at a synthesizer like that. Um, but a lot of times when we go to use a synthesizer uh, or a machine, we have a sound in mind. We know what we want to create. But oftentimes when we start using the machine, it'll guide us to another sound. It's just, it's way more approachable to us if you walk into a studio and there's just a computer at a desk. Uh, it might kind of be a run-of-the-mill type thing, and I feel like you can blank a lot more that way, whereas if you come into a room full of VCRs and um, things that just, that just beckon you to play with them, you just end up getting more content and inspiration out of it. Oftentimes, what a synthesizer will lead me to is uh, way better than what I originally had in mind. So how do we use this in two dots? Um, I think a good example is the way we came up with the main theme of the music. Um, we were sort of in a time crunch and we didn't know exactly what the style should be. So we were just making tons of demos, little recordings of pieces of music and uh, doing it pretty haphazardly. So the track that actually ultimately was chosen, Dusty Dots, uh, which is mostly acoustic guitar, um, was recorded pretty badly. Um, there was a lot of a natural sound from the room in the recording. Um, 
the sound of the fingers on the strings was almost louder than the actual music emanating out of the guitar. And it just, it struck a note with the game director and it was just that kind of hidden quality that he couldn't quite explain to us is what the game needed. And it just added this really homegrown, quirky kind of style to it. We brought a clip of that too. Here it is. By a lot of standards, that guitar sounds terrible. And most people would think that that's an abomination. But for some reason, that character that was in that guitar actually helped us figure out what the entire game's character was going to be. Uh, we, for those of you who have played Two Dots, uh, adventures into space at some point, you go further in. And the uh, idea that I had when approaching making the music for outer space was sort of the um, 60s retro futurist idea of space. And so I wanted to use a lot of analog tape and make it sound pretty rough. Um, when recording the synthesizers, I used another analog tape delay, like we saw earlier. Uh, it's actually called a, a space echo. And it sounded so bad that it, it, it could barely go in the game. I mean, it took, uh, it took five days, I think, to clean up most of these synthesizers. But the benefit, once we got them cleaned up, of the character that was added from the machines was something I couldn't have recreated uh, in the studio. Here is the, those synths. It's a good enough quality that <laughs> warrants us, it's good enough for us to even go back and every time sometimes we'll go back to it three months later and still find a bunch of hiss or some other stuff. So it's a, it's a kind of a lot of work to maintain it, but we think it's definitely worth it, the end result. Yeah. Um, another parallel example is um, a track from the Lotus World. Uh, they were actually wind chimes recorded into the micro cassette recorder that we showed you earlier. And we played the tape back at half speed and the result is this almost haunting uh, ancient sound that seemed very appropriate for the world. Another example is from actually the basic sound design from Two Dots. When we were doing the initial levels, uh, we needed a sound that was when you exit the end game and go back to the map. Um, we tried a bunch of very literal sounds at first, and then we tried a few kind of arcadey sounds, um, and nothing really worked. And then we were sitting in the studio, and we had an old 90s Casio keyboard with an 8-bit sampler built in. And we started just recording our voices and pressing buttons and see what would work. And then we submitted those to the game director with the other sounds, more appropriate sounds that we had made. And he kind of fell in love with that sound and it's actually been in the game ever since. So this is what you hear when you exit and go back to the main menu. No. That, that doesn't make any sense, but it works, right? He's saying no, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that was the first thing you think of. Uh, it, just, it just goes to show that being surrounded by that this type of equipment appeals to us and for some reason just resonates with us uh, basically making a lot of mistakes and leaving room for the errors that they create. We were really lucky to start working on a game audio at a time when people were starting to pay a lot more attention to that and the game directors really wanted something that was a little more complex and a little more interesting uh, and the technology actually allowed for there to be more variations. I think for a long time it was restricted to um, whatever we can get away with we'll put in the game but now they're actually coming and saying we have this much room for it, what can you do? It was definitely a big benefit being new to making game music because we, we had no real preconceptions of what game music should be exactly. So kind of having the freedom to just run nilly-willy with it is, uh, I think, a very good thing for two dots. Yeah, it worked out well, our incredible lack of experience in the field. Thank you guys for listening. All righty then. That's very interesting, I must say. I find it fascinating that you guys are using the, the old technology rather than 
just playing with an awful lot of plugins for Soundforge, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of interesting. Do we have any questions? Hi, guys. Um, Mathilde Pignol, uh, Roboto Games. Uh, I I loved your talk. That was uh, so different from any any uh, process, audio process I've been uh, privy to in the past. So, um, one question. One of the things that has that I've always struggled with uh, in game audio has been um, the constraints of you know, file sizes and <laughs> uh, download size, et cetera. So I was wondering if you could uh, talk to that a little bit and how, how you manage that. This is the biggest ordeal in our life. <laughs> this is like our worst nightmare every day. Um, originally, Two Dots had, uh, as we were progressing with the game, had I think 10 more pieces, eight more pieces of music in it than it does now because we've had to take so much out because of file size. Um, we originally had found a solution when the game was iOS only with using .caf files, which are a, a, a miracle file type you can do. It's an Apple format. Um, but as we've progressed, we've found shortcuts. Um, we've had to scale back a little bit of the variety that we add in sounds, would you say? Yeah. Um, do we have any other good tricks for getting around that? <laughs> I don't know. I, I find the restraints a good thing sometimes in that capacity. It gets tough when you want to make looping music because oftentimes you want the loop to have enough variation, but if you can only put in 40 seconds or a minute, you're kind of in trouble. Um, I know that developing over the air systems is really beneficial if you really want to add that much sound. So having it to where if people are by Wi-Fi, they could download it. Do we have any more? Because if not, I've got a couple of things I wanted to ask. Do you guys do anything uh, dynamically in game in terms of audio? For example, frequency switching or uh, you know bending or anything of that kind of stuff. Procedurally generated. Yeah, stuff? well, it's it's a normal sample that you'll play, but you'll do specific things when playing it, like playing it in reverse or uh, adding echo inside of the engine or pitch bending or whatever it might be. Uh, we've worked within games where we would do that uh, in an analog fashion and print a certain amount of. Uh, clips that would be uh, like with specimen that it, when it's triggered it triggers a certain clip for a certain action we don't normally work with uh, procedurally generated sounds within dots but we actually just developed um, a new sy synthesizer for doing that in the last couple weeks so we're going to be kind of shifting our system a little bit so so sounds now come with metadata so for example ranges of things like that okay you can pitch bend between this or that or the other. yeah okay that's interesting do you have a preferred type of sound engine? I mean, there are several on the market, WI, FMOD, and so on and so forth. Is there anything that you prefer to use as, a, as listening to the reproduction that you get? But like prior to the game? No, or I mean prior to it being in the game? Yeah, when, when, you're, when the game is, is written, right, they sit on top of a sound engine. There's usually a sound engine in there. And it's usually a third party one because nobody really wants to spend all the time writing direct to direct, direct X or you know, direct X sound or whatever. Um, I'm just wondering if you prefer to the tools that WIs provide you or whatever that kind of thing. We work in a purely analog form where we're, we're oh, so you're just producing WAV files and that's yep. it. That's it. That's hence why all this technology makes so much sense for what we do. Um, we've we've moved to a system now where we're moving into with um, the basic dot connections and things like that are going to be procedurally generated, but it would render the majority of this technology that we we need and love so much completely useless. It just means we need to put more garbage into it to balance out <laughs> the, the clean stuff. I understand, okay. Well, I think that looks like it. Um, I, all I can say is thanks a lot, guys. That was very interesting. A trip down memory lane there. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot.